Okay, so I think this is a good time to get started. Um, welcome, welcome again on this uh, lovely Father's Day. Um, thank you for uh, taking time to uh, come to this presentation. Uh, it's going to be part two, so I'm going to go over uh, some stuff that we talked about in part one in April, um, and then move on to uh, some newer stuff. Uh, so, um, I always think of uh, Second Life as a sort of Wonderland, so the title is a pun, uh, Catalysis and Wonderland, and I've uh, tried to show quite a few of the, um, quite a few of uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, quotes here. And I see that my laser pointer is not active. Let me uh, turn that on. And there we go. Okay, so taking it away. I use some jargon. Um, this talk is, um, um, I'm going to recycle it for my Chem 511 class, the graduate organometallics class. Um, and it's going to form some of my introductory uh, material. Oh, I talk about catalysis as introductory material. We usually get to it at, right at the end of the semester, but it's the most interesting part, and it's why we do um, organometallics. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a number of Nobel Prizes in this field that have been awarded in the last uh, 60 or so years. So what are organometallics? Well, other than being a scary word that gets some people kind of excited, um, it's um, a class of compounds that, strictly speaking, contain a metal carbon bond. Okay. In, in practice, they're going to be the ones that show uh, the reactivity that metal carbon bonds do, including uh, for metal hydrogen bond, metal NO, something that is near and dear to my heart, metal phosphorus bonds, a few others. Okay. But uh, basically, um, basically, they're going to be uh, compounds that are in low oxidation states. It's, it's a mature field. There's a lot going on in it, and to know everything that goes on with it, it's somewhat of a Red Queen's race, where you have to run as fast as you can just to uh, stay in place. So a couple of examples. Here's one. Um, that strictly speaking counts because it's got iron carbon bonds um, in the form of cyanide. Cyanide is Cn minus, and uh, the Prussian blue dye shown up here, uh, known since the uh, 1700s, and it has a lot of use in um, art and blueprints and um, even in medicine these days. Um, this is strictly speaking an organometallic. Uh, compound, although I think there would be a lot of organometallic chemists who go, yeah, Mike, yeah, okay, um, I'll get away from that. There's some more interesting things. Um, I've imported a uh, x-ray structure of uh, Prussian blue. It's the cube above. And um, I, I've simplified that structure a little bit. There's water inside uh, the cube. Um, so here, 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 and here. These are supposed to be water molecules. This particular structure had some disorder. Some of the cyanides were um, disordered or re randomly replaced with um, waters. And I've just shown three different representations. And so I'll just pull down the cube, edit, and then we move. This is one thing I wish we could do in real life. Really, I haven't smashed anyone with the cube. Um, resistance is futile. So each of the vertices represents an iron atom, and um, the uh, lines between the vertices represent cyanides. Uh, the gray, I think, represents carbon. The kind of orange rods along the sides represent uh, nitrogen. As you can see, each um, each carbon atom, I'm sorry, each iron atom is 
uh, connected to another iron atom through um, a cyanide. Beautiful stuff. This is used in medicine. Um, it'll um, absorb toxic things like cesium and thallium. Um, and uh, Prussian blue analogs are used um, or are being researched um, as uh, nanoparticles to deliver drugs to various bodies. I'll move that out of the way. That would be very inconvenient. I would love to be able to do this sort of thing in real life. Just have a big old lecture hall where uh, models can just be pulled out of the sky. Okay, so that's out of the way. Um, next slide. Um, really, the field started with ferrocene. Um, this is an iron compound. It's actually uh, got the formula C10H10 iron. It's a class of compounds called um, Sandwich compound because there's an organic group up here, an iron atom, an organic group down here. And Wilkinson got the Nobel Prize in 1973 for explaining exactly how um, this uh, molecule holds together. Uh, it's a very stable molecule. It's stable up to 500 degrees. It uh, is air stable, moisture stable. Uh, it's actually got a lot of organic chemistry going for it these days. Uh, uh, including some uh, proposed uh, pharmaceuticals. So here's an example, and I snuck in an example of catalysis in here. Um, this is this is an adenine derivative where we start on the uh, starting uh, side. It's got uh, the sugar, and the sugar has just been modified with uh, trimethyl silyl, um, trimethyl silyl uh, groups on to make it a little more easy to handle. But there's a um, whole class of um, catalysts called a palladium catalyzed coupling reaction, where essentially you take two organic molecules, maybe something that's a bromide like this one, like I got double bond something with a bromide on, and then in this particular case I've got a C triple bond CH, you could do a C double bond uh, CH as well, and the palladium does some beautiful magic. Um, I think there's probably some uh, copper that they didn't put into this particular slide. Uh, solvent was methanol. They end up taking this um, CBr group, this CH group. They made HBr, that stuff went away. And then you got the carbon-carbon uh, bond formation right here. A big problem in organic chemistry is how to make carbon-carbon bonds. And so there have been so many um, studies on how to make carbon-carbon bonds. And some of the best ones are uh, catalytic reactions. I have a reaction that's similar that I've introduced into our fourth year inorganic laboratory uh, where we do take half a gram of the two starting materials and we put a milligram of the palladium in, a milligram of some copper in, and it just chugs through the um, whole of the uh, starting materials in no time flat to give us a couple products. This ends up uh, being a way of making um, an adenine, ad adenine derivative uh, that can then be incorporated into artificial DNAs. And there's um, a whole bioorgan metallic chemistry of ferrocene. Let's see. Given that carbon carbon bonds are so common, why is it difficult to create them in the lab? Um, to create them with specificity, to make them in exactly the position that you want them to be in the molecule. And as I'll talk later, in exactly the handedness is a challenge. Because there's so many carbon-carbon bonds in organic molecules, um, it, becomes, um, it becomes a problem to uh, construct the molecules in exactly the right way. So we build a number of tools uh, so that we can do that. Okay, uh, so most of the time the catalysis is hidden over the arrow, right? So we have uh, an alkene, ethylene, we've got platinum and hydrogen, and we make an alkane. Okay, um, the ene ended 
E and E basically says there's a double bond A and ending alkane uh, basically says there's no double bond. We've simply added hydrogen molecule. Um, long ago, we figured out that solid platinum could do hydrogenation. Uh, so, why isn't platinum just used for everything? Well, again, it's selectivity. Sometimes you want to do some more interesting things with your chemicals uh, instead of just making toxic waste. Um, one of the wonderful things about transition metals is that they can bend the rules of classic organic chemistry. Um, and in the last lecture, I kind of talked about that a little bit um, in terms of uh, orbitals and where electrons can go. Um, you know, I think to summarize that, um, where electrons go in a molecule is controlled by where the various nuclei are, right? And it's just physics. It's plus charges and minus charges. The plus charges are big and massive and don't move around so quick. The minus charges, the electrons, move around real, real fast. Uh, since it's a small scale thing, there's quantization. The uh, energies of the electrons can only take certain values. Uh, and so that gives us a number of channels. We can look at different channels um, of um, where electrons happen to be. And in your organic molecule, you can upset those channels by adding a metal. So, you know, in my introductory talks to my students, I'm going to talk about oxidative addition, where you can take a metal and shove it into a maybe a carbon bromine bond. Right? So it essentially kind of inserts. Um, there's consequences to that in terms of how you uh, count the electrons, um, which lend the process its name of oxidative addition. The reverse process, where the uh, metal gets squeezed out and the two things that used to be attached are now attached to each other. That's called reductive elimination. And it, those two reactions are a beautiful example of uh, something that we call uh, the principle of microscopic reversibility. Um, if you can make something happen in the forward direction, it should be able to happen in the reverse direction. Uh, well, why would it happen at all? Well, usually we do something in the middle, like an insertion, to change the conditions a little bit so that what used to be favorable in the forward direction is now favorable in the reverse direction. So this particular example, oxidative addition, insertion, reductive elimination, three reactions can be used to uh, make a cycle of uh, reactions that um, convert um, starting materials into products. Okay, and uh, the classic example, Wilkinson's catalyst, and I've built a model of Wilkinson's catalyst. Let's uh, bring that forward. Home right now, my screen is a little bit smaller than my more awkward in placing objects. Okay, so essentially that's a stylized model. I've got a rhodium atom. Uh, if I click on this thing, here we go. We've got an animation, and we'll let it cycle through. Stop it right at the beginning. Okay, so that's kind of at the beginning. And what we've got is uh, a blue and a red ball attached to this shiny ball. That's the rhodium atom. That's the hydrogen. First thing the rhodium is going to do is split the hydrogen. There we go. Then isomerizes, so the um, atoms rearrange a little bit. And the next step here, the rhodium atom mediates the transformations. We have a coordination, basically attachment of the alkene to the metal center, which forces one of the hydrogens to 
to glom onto one of those carbons, and then the other one gloms onto a carbon. The hydrogenated molecule goes away, and then the whole thing starts over again. So I've got this uh, animation and uh, most of these other models um, um, hanging out at the um, um, area of Epidarius, very near to uh, where uh, the ship. And I think I've got them set up so that uh, you can copy them, um, you know, manifest them, res them, I guess, uh, wherever you like. So, um, you know, this is hopefully an animation that, um, that, that makes sense. I mean, it basically just goes over and over again. All right, I'll move that out of the way. Rhodium atom on its own. It had all that kind of donuty looking organic shrubbery. Around. And that stuff is kind of important, as I'll talk about just a little bit later on. Wilkinson got a Nobel Prize for ferrocene, but he's pretty well known for this Wilkinson catalyst thing. See, that same process is represented in the diagram. Absolutely. That is something relating the animation to the corresponding points in the diagram. Yes. Okay, so when I talk to my uh, graduate students or a particular, I'll uh, try to use I remember to use pointer to show how we're going around. Hey. Okay, so um, this is a pun. Basic animation for hydrogenation. Anyone who's uh, ever programmed in basic or represent go to 20. Um, essentially, there's a series of steps, and it just goes around and around and around. And of course, um, if you tried programming that into a basic uh, editor, you get a syntax error. Yay. So um, one of the things that uh, happens in Wilkinson's catalyst is that the hydrogen atom slides over to a carbon atom um, and then gets peeled off. Thing is that um, carbon atoms that are directly attached to a metal can also slide onto another carbon atom. So, um, in that case, you can get the ethylene inserting over and over and over again, and that would lead to uh, polyethylene. Right? So, um, I probably should have put an N in front of the uh, little. Uh, double line here that represents um, CH2 double bond CH2 uh, to represent uh, you know how many of these um, CH2 CH2 get together. A good catalyst is going to give you a hundred thousand or so uh, of these units strung together, a very long polymer, a good poly uh, catalyst is not going to have any kind of branches coming off at random points. Um, good catalyst is not going to give you short polymers. There are mechanisms by which short polymers can, can be made. We, you know, our technology, we pretty much mastered getting good catalysts. These things called ENSA metallocene are among the industry standards to keep today. And I've got a uh, model of ENSA metallocene right here. Edit. Now let's see if I can bring this forward without uh, crushing any of the onlookers. Can you go off a little bit? Okay. Yeah. It needs to go back. And what makes this an antimetallocene? Okay, well, ferrocene, I showed you before, is a sandwich compound. So a metallocene is a sandwich compound. It's got two kind of flattish organic groups with a metal in the middle. The ANSA is because those two things are attached to each other and are no longer parallel. They have an angle between them. Okay, so they're kind of tied back. Let's see. I need to rotate this. Wah. Looking at it from the front, 
big donut, the big green donut. This is supposed to represent a growing polymer. In the ground, I've got some extra ethylene molecules. Actually, there's not ethylene, it's propylene. What's the difference? Well, ethylene has two carbons, propylene has three carbons, and I'll talk about one of the major differences in a few slides. But for this guy, I've tried to kind of show, here's where we start, ethylene inserts, another ethylene binds inserts, binds inserts. Yeah, this is not the best animation. I'm working on uh, better animations uh, using uh, Unity. Um, and in fact, if I tried to uh, put a few more ethylenes, this, uh, this, this animation crashes. You can see as a feature, the growing polymer shifts from one side of the zirconium, it's a pink thing is a zirconium by the way, to the other, okay, in kind of a windshield wiper effect. Um, the large groups at the bottom, like near the ground that are attached, um, if they're big enough, they direct the growing polymer to always be growing up towards the sky. That has, um, that has consequences on the exact arrangements of how these things insert. All right, making me dizzy. I'm not scaring anyone with, with my chemistry talk. Not that scary. Well, except for the toxic waste. <laughs> okay. Uh, backspace, where am I now? So here's another animation, another dad joke, basic. Uh, go to 30, where we uh, simply shove more and more um, ethylene or uh, propylene into the growing polymer chain. Father's Day, I have to do dad jokes. So here's the thing. I've been talking about um, some of the details of, um, of uh, catalysis and uh, to bring these um, red, and, red and blue tetrahedra forward. Okay, a little bit awkward. Let's swing that around. So one of the, the point I want to make with these two models is that these two models are built with tetrahedra. These two models are built with tetrahedra, and you know a tetrahedron doesn't have a handedness to it. If it's just a plain old tetrahedron, the left hand form and the right hand form look exactly the same, right? You take a mirror image of a tetrahedron. Hey, it's a tetrahedron. Yay! But these tetrahedra are connected to each other, same way that carbon, which likes to have things arranged around it in a tetrahedral form, uh, can connect to each other. And I've shown if you can camera to where the um, big kind of arrow thing is. What I've shown is that um, these tetrahedra form Spirals. And as they spiral away from you, the top one spirals in a in a clockwise manner. That would be the red one. The bottom one spirals in a counterclockwise manner. These things would be mirror images of. Uh, I think I've actually got them so that you know they would be mirror images of. I've actually arranged them so they're mirror images. That's um, but the thing is, you could never 
take one and physically manipulate it um, to be able to overlap with the other. Uh, these things uh, will not um, physically overlap, just like your uh, left hand and your right hand. There's no way you can physically manipulate your right hand in space to make it into a left hand. Okay, and I'm, I'm assuming you don't have access to a black hole or something like that, or a time machine, or something that will rotate you through four-dimensional space. In three-dimensional space, your left hand will never become um, a right hand. That's the same for uh, some of these molecules. And uh, it's a feature that's really important for biochemistry, because molecular recognition in biochemistry is um, why most biochemicals work. Um, if handed form of a molecule and you feed it the left-handed form of a molecule, it will not uh, recognize it. So one of the wonderful things about a catalyst is that it can leave an imprint of its handedness on the product. There are or strictly organic ways of making polymers. Uh, radical condensation, um, con there are radical polymerization, there's condensation polymerization, there's carbanion methods. Um, but none of these have the ability to control the handedness as new molecules of ethylene or propylene are added. Well, yeah, and you know, my. Uh, my chair that I'm sitting on, I'm a bit disappointed with it because it's it it doesn't seem to be a left hand or a right hand. I was I was hoping to use it as a example of handedness, but but no. All right. Okay. So uh, a little bit about handedness. So I've got a molecule here. It happens to be, I think, uh, one chloroethanol. And there's a left-handed form and a right-handed form. These two drawings are depicting um, mirror images of each other. The conventions we use, if we have just a line, then a plain old line just says, OK, that's parallel to the plane of this screen. This little hashtag or this little hash line from the this vertex to the chloride represents um, angling out behind the screen. This one, uh, the wedge, uh, represents angling out in front of the screen. Turns out, and, and I've, I've drawn these as mirror images, and it turns out there's no way to take models of these and superimpose them. That's one thing that Second Life would be handy for. If I had models of them, uh, there would be no way in space to uh, rotate them so that, that they perfectly superimpose. And how we, as chemists, uh, look at molecules, um, you know, we take uh, the CH bond and we um, look at the molecule holding the hydrogen um, opposite. Um, to us, and we look down that CH axis. Okay? So basically, the, in, in my little drawing here, the CH is way in back. And there's rules for doing this, but you usually just take, go by molecular weight, and your biggest molecular weight, then your um, next biggest, so chlorine, then oxygen, then carbon. And, and if there's ties, if it's, everything's carbon, there's other rules. I won't go into them. But, you know, basically this would be a counterclockwise um, definition or a spiral. Doing the same thing, chlorine to oxygen to carbon in the mirror image is a clockwise. And essentially, well, we just say, okay, one's going to be S for the counterclockwise. I've always remembered it as S is for sinister, which is uh, being left, and R is for right. Um, yeah, it doesn't doesn't really make sense as a mnemonic because one's uh, in Latin, one's in English, but but it, it works for me. These two molecules, um, the R and the S, what are the absolute configurations in terms of rules? 
Ah, racemic. Yes. So if you had 100% uh, of the S form, uh, then you know it would be it would be a uh, single what we would call enantiomer. But if you had a 50-50 mixture of the two forms, that would be called racemic, because um, you know basically the S form is called the race mate of the um, R form. So racemic is basically a random mixture. Hey, there's inorganic hand in this as well. So carbon does uh, tetrahedral. Um, what we usually do here is um, for um, octahedral complexes, here's a special case. The metal has six things attached. Octahedral simply means you got something on top, on the bottom, to the left, to the right, and in front and in back. Let's say you've got three different flavors of things attached. You put one flavor in the back, and then you see where the thing that is on the top goes. Does it go to the left or does it go to the right? And for inorganic chemicals, instead of R and S, we use capital lambda and capital delta. So here, capital lambda would be left and capital delta would be dextrin. So yeah, it, it doesn't make sense in terms of how the Latin um, and, and Together, but you know, it, 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 it works for me. Um, there's also D and L, these, these uh, smaller, uh, lowercase letters. They are used to describe, and I'll, I'll try a couple of slides on this, the rotation of plane polarized light. And uh, there's going to be no relation between D and L and the R and S, the inorganic chemistry, the delta and lambda. This uh, handedness is a fundamental property of organic chemistry um, that was discovered a long time ago. Discovered before um, atoms were accepted, right? 1850s, um, you know, the atomic theory was still just a theory back then. Um, it was discovered um, before um, it was really known that carbon could be tetrahedral. In fact, this uh, was evident for the tetrahedral carbon, or tetrahedral nature of carbon. Um, so it comes from tartaric acid, and tartaric acid can exist. There's actually several uh, structures of it, but I've shown L and D. And one of the wonderful things about tartaric acid is that if you take um, this hydrogen off and this hydrogen off, replace them with uh, a sodium, which is Na+, plus, and an ammonium, NH4+. Plus. That substance, the sodium ammonium rate, okay, that substance crystallizes as single enantiomer. So one form, the left-handed form, forms its own set of crystals. The right-handed form forms its own set of crystals. This is really unusual. Um, most of the time, if you have a left-handed form and a right-handed form, they will get together to complement each other to form maybe something that packs better in a single crystal. But um, Louis Pasteur found sodium ammonium tartrate, gave you a left-handed crystal, right-handed crystals. He could pick them apart with uh, tweezers and then do some tests on them. Um, For the test, very simple actually. Um, here's an old style polarimeter. Essentially, what this is is a light source. There's a polarizing filter, just like what you'd have in your 3D glasses if you went to a recent 3D movie. You'd put a solution of your sample there, and then um, you'd have another filter um, in the eyepiece. And the thing about polarizing filters is that if you have them at 90 degrees to each other, um, they don't let any light through. If you have a sample that's, quote unquote, optically active in between these two filters, 
you find, hey, it's not 90 degrees. There's a different angle there because the sample is doing some rotation of the light. Okay, a DNL plus and minus um, those labels on compounds tell you about how they rotate the light, but they don't translate into the uh, structural um, labels that I talked about. In the uh, Journal of Chemical Education, a beautiful demo, I just had to share it. Um, cell phones emit polarized light. So if you have 3D glasses, um, and you uh, put them over your cell phone, you'll see one lets through more light than the other. Essentially because um, you know uh, the cell phone is going to emit polarized light. That light is going to tend to line up in, I don't know, let's call it the vertical direction. The vertical lens on the um, 3D glasses will let light through. The horizontal lens well, if the horizontal lens only lets horizontally polarized light through, and the cell phone's only emitting vertically polarized light, no light's going to get through. The beautiful thing is that um, Dr. Thompson recognized if you have a Petri dish with a sample in it that's optically active, like all of these handed molecules that I've been talking about, um, you'll have to rotate that um, polarized uh, lens a little bit to be able to um, you know, get the full darkening um, effect. So uh, this is a beautiful demonstration. <laughs> I, I, um, newer polarimeters simply just look like, um, you know, little plastic boxes a lot. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I like to see, I like to see the older stuff. But, um, the left-handed form and right-handed forms, they, they really do remain um, significant challenge for organic chemistry. And this is a uh, article that came out, I think, only a couple of weeks ago, like May 31. Um, and uh, these folks have uh, tried to develop a gaming app to, uh, show, um, to show chirality. So, So getting back to uh, polymerization, um, propylene, the three carbons, when you have four things attached to a single carbon, and all four of those things are different, then you have a recipe for handedness. It's going to be left-handed form or right-handed form. So propylene itself has a mirror plane, right, because it's a planar molecule, so the plane it exists in. But what that what it means though is that uh, when after it reacts to make the polypropylene, um, it will be what we say chiral. Um, so um, it's prochiral. I would have said prechiral, but I didn't get to name things. So probably good that I didn't get to name things. And you know one of the things I really like is, is um, in Alice in Wonderland you can always find something appropriate. Uh, here's uh, Alice through the licking uh, glass to talk about um, chiral molecules. So we can get uh, the catalyst to control uh, geometry. Um, what is, what do I mean by head to head? Well, uh, back, to, back to here, if we consider this end to be the head of the molecule, and this end to be um, the tail of the molecule, because they're different, right? Little CH3 group can be a tail. Then you can uh, worry about um, do these things attach CH2 to CH2 and the end with the methyl group to the end with the methyl group? That would be uh, head to head. That's uncommon. Usually you get head to tail with CH2. Um, you know, C CH2 to C8 uh, to the um, end of the methyl group to CH2 to the end of the methyl group. And what is nice is to get these things attached so that you have the same handedness at all the sites. Okay, and there's a 
term there called isotactic. Another term, symbiotactic, where you get the um, left hand form, right hand form, left hand form, right hand form. And believe it or not, uh, how these left handed forms and right handed forms um, alternate or not is going to um, change the properties of the polymers. And, or you could just have random, which would be tactic. Uh, and there's other ones that are maybe um, eutactic. Maybe it's non-random, but maybe it's complex. So um, I showed the zirconicine animation. I kind of thought of it as a mad tea party. In the story, uh, every so often, um, they all get up, run around the table, and find new seats. And that kind of reminded me of what was going on with the zirconicine catalyst. Uh, and here in uh, Unity, um, um, which they talked about um, last uh, week a little, um, I've uh, started uh, scripting um, a little more smooth animation that uh, I'll use in my class and hopefully try to get as an MP4. All right. Mm -hmm. Talks a little bit about um, a little bit about the properties of the syndiotactic polypropylene superior uh, properties. Um, you know, basically um, better better stuff and more easily uh, uh, recycled. Polymers are built to last. Okay, so uh, PBS uh, recently had a series, and uh, they reported that the equivalent of a dump truck of plastics goes into the oceans every single minute, uh, every minute of every day, and that's that is a lot of plastic. The same catalysts that are used to make these things cannot be used to construct them. Uh, the catalysts themselves are air and moisture sensitive, uh, so um, you know there's just no way that they could be used to unzip all of the polymers into their starting materials again. It would be nice, and I think people are uh, looking at ways of doing this, including biological ways. And I think uh, SR was looking at that um, uh, the last time we spoke. So, You know, it'd be nice to use less. Here we are in judgment of uh, plastics. I know the Queen of Hearts, uh, she bakes some tarts, but she was using plastic uh, utensils to serve them. You need to ask whether glass is an option. Uh, plastics in the environment turn into microplastics, nanoplastics. This, this is a bad um, thing. Recycling, including steel and aluminum, is something that's necessary. Biodegradable plastic. Uh, we have to look at just how they biodegrade because if they just biodegrade into nanoplastics, microplastics, then that has really kicked the problem down um, in scale rather than, oh yeah, rather than um, rather than uh, out of sight, out of mind. One last classic uh, catalyst here, the Grubbs Catalyst, Nobel Prize uh, 2005. I've met Dr. Grubbs a couple of times. Um, and here's one that should be perplexing to you. It's got a ruthenium carbon double bond. Uh, those other versions with molybdenum, the molybdenum ones tend to be highly air and moisture sensitive, uh, you know, bursting into flames on exposure to the air. The ruthenium ones are much more tolerant of air and moisture and even exotic functional groups on the organics that you're using to react them. And the bottom line with this reactivity, say you've got two alkenes, you mix two alkenes. There's one with four of the same group, another with four of a different group. What will happen is that this catalyst breaks the carbon-carbon double bond, essentially, and scrambles the uh, two starting materials. Uh, this is an equilibrium, and uh, you know if you can 
you know, usually what happens is that you go in the opposite direction. You get maybe a CH2 double bond something interesting, and the ruthenium will give you a CH2 CH2, which bubbles away, and then the two things that are interesting uh, end up attached uh, to each other. So uh, this is called uh, alkene metathesis, and it's become a key um, key tool in carbon carbon double bond formation in the last uh, little while. Um, so for uh, making elastomers like bouncy plastics, um, ring opening reaction by this uh, catalyst are very important. So ROMP here is ring opening metathesis polymerization. And you start with something like, that's a molecule of dicyclopentadiene. And what it can do, I don't know why this bottom one doesn't react. I think it does, and so you get some cross-linking. But what it can do is basically take one of these um, double bonds and um, open them up so they attach to the next molecule. And this, because the double bonds have uh, forced certain geometries on the molecules, uh, this ends up giving you a little more um, compression and bounciness to the final polymer. Nickel bounciness. So, and you know, if we look at how this uh, start off with some catalyst, it's got a ruthenium carbon double bond, and then the next double bonded molecule comes in, and it forms this four membered intermediate. The ruthenium going to the first carbon, and then yeah, and the double bonds have kind of um, share the bond um, in between them, so as to form the four-membered ring. Four-membered ring has no memory and can split off the um, the mixed unit, right? The bond here, and we break a bond there, then we get this guy. No real difference in reactivity between this structure at the bottom and this structure at the top. Right? So uh, you might ask, hey, what if one of these comes in? Well, if one of those comes in, you'll still get this. There will be no change. So you don't even have to. Um, it forms a four-membered intermediate. There's no memory. So if the bond breaks there and there, then again we get more mixed and we're back to where we started with. Um, for me, being able to just cut apart double bonds is, is just fantastic. This is something that I never dreamed of when I was an undergraduate. And so finally at the end, um, talk a little bit about nanoparticles. Um, so the newer directions in this chemistry are to figure out uh, what happens at surfaces. Right at the beginning, I talked about hydrogenation using uh, platinum metal. Well, the platinum surface is what does the hydrogenation. All that platinum on the inside of a big particle is just wasted. So a big move to find out what's going on um, on surfaces has been to look at nanoparticles. Um, here's a slide or to remind me to direct your attention upward to the giant nanoparticle. The giant nanoparticle, I guess it's just a particle, isn't it, um, that I brought here. Hopefully I'm not going to crush too many people with my giant nanoparticle. There we go. Um, this is a really well-defined uh, particle. I'm, <laughs> Hades, I'm sorry, I don't think this fits on the screen. This is a really well-defined particle. It's two icosahedra of gold that share a vertex. The um, waste of this thing has uh, some sulfur atoms. The orange atoms are phosphorus. The uh, gold, or the green atoms are gold. This um, is a well-defined nanoparticle because you can crystallize it and um, you know that every particle of the, um, or every molecule of this stuff is the same. 
And that's not true for all nanoparticles. With well-defined nanoparticles like this, I mean, just put it back up there, um, it's a lot of gold. With well-defined nanoparticles like that one, we can start to figure out what is going on. So, um, just um, looking at the looking at the surface of this chemistry just a little bit. Um, here's four types of nanoparticles. This particular paper uh, published in American Chemical Society ACS Catalysis. There's a whole journal on catalysis from the American Chemical Society, published in 2014. Um, nanoparticles that have been found to have uh, these um, particular shapes. Uh, they have surfaces, and the gold atoms on the surfaces, particularly easy to make gold nanoparticles, by the way, but uh, the gold nanoparticles on the surface, some of them are on um, an edge, some of them are in a face, some of them might be defect sites on a, a corner. They all have different reactivity that we now have the technology to probe. Go into those uh, in too much detail. Maybe this would be a great talk for, or a great thing to do a separate talk on. Um, and how do we know what these nanoparticles look like? Well, we can basically take um, um, electron microscope images of them and uniform uh, microcrystals of these uh, nanoparticles, all with these kind of different shapes. So little rods, little starry type shapes, uh, starry type shapes that are um, kind of fused on the face, and then ones that are more uh, spherical. Okay, and so, you know, we can prove what sort of um, shapes these things have. And they're small enough so that we know what sort of environment the atoms are, are in on their faces. So here's a paper. They were catalyzing, uh, don't, don't quote me on this, I think they were catalyzing carbon monoxide turned into methanol or something like that. Um, each, each column, this is the particular shape from the nanoparticle. This would be the data that says there's some catalysis happening. And then are measures of the different sorts of catalysis. My point with this particular slide is that the different environments give you different um, reactivity, but the reactivity is stuff we've worked out from those smaller molecules like Wilkinson's catalyst and the antimethalocenes and the palladium catalyzed coupling reaction. Um, all of those molecules happen in the solution state at single. Um, metal atoms, and we were able to figure out what's going on um, using uh, the traditional techniques, spectroscopic techniques, um, and um, come armed with that knowledge into this nano field um, chemistry. To the end here. Um, so, you know, a lot of phenomena for these nanoparticles remain to be investigated. My own um, interests are inorganic chemistry and electrochemistry. Um, you know, and this was a beautiful paper that came out uh, a couple of years ago. I really like the, uh, this is the table of contents entry. Um, you can make these nanoparticles. They're called core shell nanoparticles. And that's these uh, kind of orangey looking atoms in the core of a nanoparticle. The gold is particularly easy to make uh, well-defined shapes from, and then they coat the outside of those shapes with uh, palladium. Uh, this would be a, this would be an octahedron. Uh, there's just a slight, there's just a uh, slice taken out of it so you can see what's in the core. And these guys kind of did some electrochemistry. They oxidized, reduced, an electrode surface for a while, and uh, showed that uh, the atoms can migrate around, right? Um, which gives, which kind of is a problem if you're palladium in the reaction you want, and it ends up inside the particle, then it's not going to be the reaction anymore. All right, so, you know, in conclusion, our transition metal organometallics. Um, lots of Nobel Prizes and 
in uh, this area. Lots of benefits to society. One of the early ones, I think, was uh, the synthesis of large quantities of L-DOPA to treat Parkinson's and uh, other diseases. Um, small amounts of very expensive substances, platinum, palladium, can be used economically. Um, the um, ruthenium that is used for the ring opening metathesis polymerizations ends up in the polymer. So if you have elastomers, they've got probably a little bit of trace of ruthenium in there. Lots of applications. We need to recognize that um, while chemistry, um, you know, while chemicals have lots of benefits, they also have lots of drawbacks to the two go hand in hand. Um, so, you know, um, there are future applications in terms of um, better substances that are more friendly for our environment and for remediation of substances in the environment as well. Uh, acknowledgements, I get my x-ray data from uh, these places, Crystallography Open Database, um, the, um, the uh, RCSB Protein Data Bank, um, Cambridge, um, American Mineralogist, uh, and Small Blender Unity to um, make many of the models I've shown you. Okay, I definitely acknowledge Science Circle. I love these talks. I love uh, being part of this. Um, the NSF has been very uh, helpful with um, funding for uh, my regular research. And I consider this an outreach activity for my regular research. These guys are my uh, recent grad, current and recent graduate students. George is my uh, collaborator from Oklahoma. Uh, and my school, on definitely all of you, and for your attention and continued support. So I think that's where, that's where I should end. I thought, yeah, uh, this, is, this is more. I'm happy to take questions. Oh, these details determined in the lab. Yes, so uh, there's a number of things that can be done. Um, if you have a reaction that um, is catalyzed by some substance, you can use various forms of spectroscopy to look at how the starting materials are consumed and how the products are um, generated. So, for example, you could use UV vis spectroscopy if there's a color change, or infrared spectroscopy um, to look at how, mo how um, molecules vibrate. Right? So, each molecule has a fingerprint of vibration. Maybe there's uh, particular wavelengths that are indicative of um, its presence. Spectroscopy can be used to quantitate in terms of uh, getting um, concentration. And if you plot concentration versus time, you can do some nasty math and get back to what the rate determining steps are, which tend to involve the transition or the, the catalysts themselves. Um, we can also use magnetic resonance uh, techniques for the same purpose. Um, so a lot of a lot of what we know is spectroscopic. The other things we can do is change the concentration. So if you have a catalyst that takes two things and couples them together, what if you only put one thing in there, and then you isolate and crystallize and get the structure of the um, the metal complex that results? Then that gives you clues. So in, there's a whole lot of experiments that are spectroscopic and synthetic. Uh, and these days, we can do um, quantum mechanical calculations fairly easily um, to be able to make some predictions about structures. When I was a student, the quantum mechanical calculations um, were predicted to take hundreds of thousands of years to actually compute how simple reactions would go. Um, with um, the advances in computers in the last 30 years, plus the advances in algorithms, um, those, those, those things take an afternoon. 
um, high time resolution. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, you know, it depends. It depends on depends on um, how you uh, set up the reaction. If you do things dilute so that the molecules have a hard time finding each other, then you can get um, then you can get um, some reactivity studies at a more reasonable pace. Or you could do electrochemistry, and uh, if you do indirect study electrochemistry, where you're looking at um, how electron transfer reactions compete with diffusion, you can uh, look at reactions whose rates are up to the diffusion limit. That's kind of one of the things I do. Blender. It's got a steep learning curve. Right. Well, if there's no more questions, I'll let you guys get back to your regular Father's Day activities. I should probably give my dad a call. I talked to him yesterday. All right, Susan G, thank you for coming. Yeah, I forgot about Father's Day. I probably should have done it yesterday. Cool. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Um, I'll come back uh, this week, Chantal, and kind of clear out the, uh, some of these or all of these uh, materials and uh, repopulate the, uh, the um, lab um, portion of the uh, sim. All right. Cool. I think well, we're going to go off and have coffee somewhere. So. Hope everyone has a great day. I'm going to uh, stand up and log out. Well, maybe I'll reset. Refresh one, one. There we go. Reset this guy. Okay. Excellent. And I think I've got all of these objects um, set so people can uh, copy and. Um, I want to say paste, but um, you know, um, make uh, you know, take your own copies if you like. Uh, you know, basic. And a lot of these have, um, if you click on them, notepad, note, um, notes, notes show up. Alrighty, all right, guys, stand up, and we're going to go off for coffee. So again, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you later.